Now, we have conducted a complete survey of the carbon system in the ocean in the 1990s and already determined the amount of anthropogenic CO2 in the ocean. This was 99 cruises conducted by eight different countries. We brought the, to get there all the data in my laboratory, we corrected all the data, and provided a unique data set with a high degree of precision of accuracy, over 72,000 samples. It took us five years to, to, to develop all this data set. And what we found is that we could determine the distribution of anthropogenic CO2 in the oceans. And you can see here from the Indian and Pacific profiles that most of the anthropogenic CO2 resides in the upper 1,500 meters of the water column. With the exception of the North Atlantic, where it penetrates all, to the, all the way to the bottom, we still have the condition where anthropogenic CO2 still resides in the upper part of the water column, where most of our organisms of concern still live. And this anthropogenic CO2 is causing a shoaling of this aragonite and calcite saturation horizons towards the surface. So where this corrosive water is uh, approaching, we are already seeing the effects of anthropogenic CO2 on the corrosiveness of the water towards the surface. And here I show the migration of those surfaces towards the surface in the Indian and the Pacific with the very shallow regions of the North Pacific here uh, showing very shallow corrosive waters as close as 100 meters in the North Pacific by Alaska. So if we map the distribution of this corrosive water, we can see the global impacts. And right here we see that it's still deep in the North Atlantic, about 2,500 meters for aragonite, 3,500 meters for calcite, except for this region, the eastern North Atlantic. And in the Pacific, you can see it's quite shallow. As I said, it's very shallow all around Alaska, but along our coasts of Washington, Oregon, and California, and in South America, is abutting right against the continental shelf. So any changes to the circulation and upwelling of water onto the surface will cause this corrosive water to come onto our continental shelf. So what we did was we worked with Jim Orr and developed a map of the distribution of this uh, aragonite saturation for the world oceans. The blue colors are, are very safe colors for or organisms. The uh, cyan or magenta are conditions where calcifying organisms, particularly coral reef systems, will begin to have problems. And when you get in the yellow and reds, they're in severe stress. What we find with the model projecting from 1775 is that out to 2100, with a business as usual scenario, the entire world oceans will be under stress for ocean acidification. And the high Arctic regions and the high Antarctic regions will be in undersaturated waters by the end of this century. The Arctic Ocean was not included in this, but in fact, the Arctic Ocean will be the first to see corrosiveness. And by 2050, the entire Arctic Oceans will be in undersaturated waters, faster than all the ocean basins. So uh, we have to concern ourselves with some of the natural processes that can accelerate this process. And along our coast, there's a natural coastal upwelling process that occurs in the summertime. It's diagrammed here. When the winds come from the northwest, the surface waters are pushed offshore, and the deeper waters are moved onto shore. And this upwelling process is, occurs from Canada to Mexico. And so in 2007, we were able to have a cruise to define how this impacts our continental shelf along our coast. And what we found was, indeed, we do have an upwelling process. This first slide shows the temperature and density. And on these density surfaces, we see very cold waters less than 9 degrees being pushed onto our shelf and in some place moving all the way to the surface and all the way to the coast. These waters carry with it the corrosive undersaturated waters, the waters with the saturation uh, data less than 1.0. So these corrosive waters are on our continental shelf right now. And the pH of those waters are less than 7.7. .7. What we would expect for models to occur at the end of the century is occurring right now on our continental shelf. In our, in our coastal region. And so we mapped this out at uh, the surface in 120 meters. And you see at 120 meters, this corrosive water is everywhere we looked from uh, Canada to Mexico and probably uh, proceeds all the way down to South America. And we can see evidence of this in the surface waters in the blue areas you see there upwelling on our continental shelf. We have had colleagues 
uh, Nikki Gruber from UCLA and colleagues model this, and you can see on the right-hand panel the corrosive low pH water in blue, uh, upwelling during the summer months all the way along our entire coast, and then vecting out into the surface waters to the west. So this is an upwelling process that occurs anywhere from March through November and occurs all the way along our entire continental shelf. This is a serious problem for our region and its ocean ecosystems. So how do we study ocean acidification? We do this, or use a variety of different approaches. We do work in the laboratory settings with aquaria. We have mesocosm experiments on large scale and in the oceans. And we also do work directly in the oceans with, with experiments that are done over coral reef systems. Our work at the mesocosm level in a large scale setting has shown a direct correspondence between the capability of the coral reefs to calcify and form their skeletons and the uh, decrease in carbonate ion concentration from left to right here. On the top I've laid out the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that would rep be representative of these carbonate ion concentrations. And you can see by a level of 560 microatmosphere in the atmosphere, the carbonate species would no longer be able to produce their skeletons. This has been reproduced many, many times and for all, all uh, coral reef systems we find the same result. Now a recent paper that just came out the, this past month have shown that indeed in the uh, uh, Great Barrier Reef region uh, over 328 parietes samples were studied and what they found is a remarkable decline in calcification since 1990 as much as 14 percent and an accelerating decline in the last five to six years. So there is an indication now from field observations that what we are seeing in the laboratory has some validity. Another way of looking at these kinds of experiments in the field is the work that is being done in Bergen with mesocosm experiments. These are large bags that are put out into the water column and they are, uh, are, have a controlled CO2 level. The, these are done at the 190 parts per million, which is the pre-industrial CO2 level, 370 parts per million, which is the present day level, and 700 parts per million, which would be the level we might expect to see towards the end of the century. And we've looked at uh, coccolithophorids, which are calcifying uh, plants, foraminifera and, and pteropods. The foraminifera and pteropods are primary food source for our fish and other uh, mammals and birds. And so we are seeing then that the changes that are taking place with these organisms through the food webs. The pteropods in particular, which are on the bottom, they are the primary food source for the juvenile uh, salmon and pollock and other species that we depend on for food. And what we find in these experiments is a very striking decrease in calcification rate, anywhere from 9 to 45 percent, and a deformation of these uh, calcifying organisms. Indeed, some of the organisms actually no longer calcify at all in the high CO2 concentrations. With respect to foraminifera, we find that uh, both in the laboratory and in the field that there is a decrease in shell weight, a thinning of the shells, and we can see this in, sh in cores from recent sediments as well. We find about a 14 percent decline in the shell uh, weight uh, with concentrations as high as 780 parts per million. Now with the pteropods that I mentioned earlier, my colleague Vicki Fabry from, from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography has shown to us that the, the living pteropods, when placed in the high CO2 waters, begin to have their shells dissolve while they're still alive. And you can see here the, the dissolution of, of their shells. And this means that they will ha no longer, in some places, have a place where they can form their shells if we continue along this pathway that we're on. With uh, closer to home, we look at the effects on, on mussels and, and, and uh, oysters, and we see the same decreasing calcification of the mussels and oysters, anywhere from 10 to 25 percent with increasing CO2 levels. And indeed, if you look at the juvenile species, the clams, for example, when they're just formed the first time, within 24 hours there's massive dissolution of the shells. That's the whitening of the shells that you can see. And within two, two weeks the shells are gone and the animals have died. 
And you can see this processes in very short order in real time along our, our coast in, in New England.